After our launch day investigation into delitting the 9900K and finding its shortcomings, we've been working on a follow-up involving lapping the inside of the IHS and applying liquid metal to close the story on improvement potential with the delid process. We're also returning to bring everyone back to reality on delitting the 9900K because it's not quite as easy as it may look from what you're seeing online. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Rock 4 and Dark Rock Pro 4 CPU coolers. These high-end coolers focus on a smarter approach to air cooling by adding a mini fin stack on top of the direct contact cold plate, adding small bumps to the fins for increased service area, and by using Silent Wayne's 135mm fans custom built for high performance cooling without too much noise. The Pro is a dual tower cooler rated for 250W TDP, while the Dark Rock 4 is built for 200W TDPs. Learn more at the link in the description below. Just a quick reminder on this, we already kind of went over this process in our review of the 9900K, but now we're adding on it a bit. So we've lapped the inside of the IHS, basically sanded it down, and we've added liquid metal. And this is something that we knew before launch, Roman was working on as well, and we followed it up a bit after him. So our initial testing focused on thermal paste, high-end paste versus solder. And you can see those results in the previous, in the review or later on in this content. But now we're looking at liquid metal uh, and seeing how much further we can improve it. We'll also be talking about just is it even worth delitting? And we kind of addressed that already. So the task of lapping the inside of the IHS arose out of necessity for this one. It wasn't because we necessarily wanted to. The truth of the matter is that no matter what all of the tech reviewers, including us, make it look like on camera, it's actually a higher level of difficulty to do this delid than all the previous delids. So this is something we tried to touch on in the review because it's easy to look at everyone delitting their processors and think, this is a good idea, I should do it. But it's not quite that. I mean, you're seeing edited down versions of what everyone's doing, again, including us. So it might take a couple hours, whereas on camera, it looks like maybe five or 10 minutes. So it's worth talking about that and making sure everyone's clear on if you should actually do this or not. And the 9900K, to really get it working well, it's not exceedingly difficult with a D-Lid, but it is definitely more work than popping the CPU into a D-Litter, turning a screw, and then putting some liquid metal on it. It's not quite that easy. So for this job, of course, you'll need to remove the silicone adhesive. That's not difficult. Then you'll also need to carefully remove all the excess indium solder from the die and the IHS. It is principally important that both surfaces are smooth when the D-Lid is done. If it's not smooth and there are chunks of indium still remaining, the CPU will almost instantly throttle when used, especially with liquid metal. Liquid metal surface tension requires it to have an opposing surface that is also coated in liquid metal, and depth differentials could throw off the contact and increase the likelihood of air gaps between the liquid metal. This isn't like a paste where it'll just squish out and fill in any of the gouges or bumps and make up for mistakes. Although we haven't tried it, one could theoretically use liquid metal to help dissolve some of the indium. We know that one is a gallon stand and the other one's just indium, but again, we haven't tried that. We took the more barbaric approach of a knife, but this requires a lot of patience. Slipping or getting too aggressive will very likely result in a dead CPU, hence the difficulty is a bit higher here. As for internal lapping of the IHS, we have some footage of that process as well. There are better ways to do it, but it worked out decently. So the way we did this was we wanted to help deal with gouges that were left over from indium removal where uh, you kind of use the knife and scrape it up and you might end up with a slight cut mark or a slight difference in depth between where the indium was and where it wasn't, of course. And so what we did, we used grit 600 sandpaper, then 1200, then 2000, then 2000 wet, then 3000, then 3000 wet, and ended up with a very polished surface. So it worked well. Uh, there's more you can do, of course, there always is with this stuff, but uh, it was good enough. It was good enough to see an improvement. And we'll talk more about this process towards the end, but let's go over some of the new results first and get those charts on the screen. So we're not going to reread and re-explain everything from the review. You can check the review the first quarter of it if you want to see those results initially. Uh, so if you haven't checked that and you have questions about testing or what have you, then check that content out as well. When testing versus a high-end thermal grizzly cryonaut paste, as we said in the review, we found that the differences didn't amount to much. Intel solder was only four to five degrees better than good paste on average, leaving plenty of room to improve. After our liquid metal application, we saw a temperature reduction from about 64.4 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient to about 60 degrees over ambient. 
That's an additional four degree drop in our Blender AVX workload. It is possible to get even bigger temperature reductions, of course, but that might be something we explore separately with die sanding. And this is where it's kind of interesting. The reason we didn't see better performance here with liquid metal, or well, we did, but it's only four degrees, is because we have not yet sanded down the die to be smoother. The IHS could be improved as well. And so there are some marks on the die or on the surface of it from removing the solder previously. And those marks are where you have issues with the surface tension of liquid metal as opposed to paste, which can fill even fractions of a millimeter of a dip where liquid metal struggles. And that's the point of this content. It's to illustrate how much extra effort is required to really get good performance. We spoke with Derbauer separately about his improvements, and he spent an entire week getting his D-Lid dialed. Surface smoothness is now the biggest limiter to our performance results. As a reminder, this is on our Kraken X62 standardized test bench cooler, not the crazy setup we had for the stream. A four degree drop isn't bad, considering there's still so much more we could do, and it's what helped contribute to our higher overclocks when on stream a few days ago. Speaking of the stream, let's look at some of our overclocking results. Our original overclock was confined to 5.2 gigahertz at about 1.35 volts after accounting for V-droop, as we began running up against thermal limitations with the solder and X62 cooler. Although the extra nine degrees will help with overclocking on the X62, we switched to a 540 millimeter SE radiator from EK for our live stream. We also attached four of the Vardar Furious fans to it, producing enough airflow to create hair flow, as you can see in the live stream footage and it was very loud as well. With all these things combined, we stepped our overclock up to 5.3 gigahertz stable, or 5.4 with pseudo stability, and we could definitely eventually achieve stability with more work. We also increased the cache ratio to 50X eventually later on, and we still have a lot more work to do on memory configurations, but we saw increases in Cinebench and time spy performance alike. We'll post some of those numbers on the screen now. For Cinebench, as reference, just changing memory increased the score from about 2018 to about 2064 multi-threaded. The point of showing that is to just show the performance difference from a memory change as we used a slightly different build for the live stream. Here's our scaling chart with the memory. We measured 2153 CB marks when at 5.0 gigahertz all core, a climb of 4.3% over the 2064 score. Going to 5.2 gigahertz all core pushed us to 2265 CB marks or another 5% climb over the previous score and a climb of 9.7% over the baseline 2064 marks. At 5.3 gigahertz, we measured 2292 CV marks, and we're now hitting diminishing returns, with about a 1.1% improvement for the extra 100 megahertz all core. Cinebench did not finish at 5.4 gigahertz with this setup, but TimeSpy physics did complete. For TimeSpy, we measured 11,833 marks at 5.0 all core, 12,021 at 5.1, or a 1.6% increase, then 12,147, at 5.2, another 1% climb, and then 12,419 at 5.3, finally ending at 12,521 at 5.4 gigahertz. We measured a score of 12,635 at 5.3 with a 50x cache ratio and 4,000 megahertz RAM, but this is not comparable to the previous results. This is where we bring it back to reality then. Delitting has never been a hard requirement with Intel's processors, never. So it's easy to get that confused. Out of the box, it works. It does okay. It's never really been commendable thermally, but it's fine. There's a reason they can sell it like that and not get laughed out of the market. It has become a serious requirement for actual real overclocking efforts, as we've illustrated. 20 degree reductions on a 7980XE 18 core part are very easily done with a D-Lid and liquid metal. So absolutely it helps. This can help outside of overclocking as well, like if you want to just drive down your noise levels by reducing your fan speed because the processor doesn't run as hot anymore. So there are, there have been good uses for delitting outside of the live stream type stuff we do where it's competitive overclocking kind of exits practicality. With the 9900K though, that benefit of the, the practical benefits start to fade and you start to look more at primarily competitive overclocking benefits, which are realistically very impractical for most users. So with the soldered TPU, it's still not a requirement to delit it. The solder is absolutely better than the original Dow Corning thermal paste that Intel used, so we give them credit for that improvement. Intel soldered this one out of necessity. The company could not have achieved the clocks that it did with thermal paste, at least not as easily, and not across all eight cores, not without some form of increased cooling efficiency, and that was through a better interface. So even still, 
it's clearly possible to improve performance. You could go direct I2. We've got to cut it off somewhere, though. And as for whether it's worth it to delid, realistically, the answer is no, more so than previously. Previously, the answer has been maybe, because it's really not difficult. You pop it in a delider, you turn a screw, you put a new interface on it, and you're done. Not that hard. But now, uh, and it's still not that hard, but now you remove the solder too, and there's a higher risk of killing or damaging the CPU. There is more trial and error testing involved where you might think it's pretty good, put it into a system, hopefully in test bench setup, not an actual computer, and then maybe it's overheating instantly, which sometimes happens with the previous delid attempts too, but not nearly as often. So if you're going to delid, just be aware that it might be a couple of hours of trial and error if you're really inexperienced with this stuff and you haven't done it before. And it might be maybe an extra 30 minutes to an hour if you have done this before, uh, because there is still going to be more testing involved. Generally, the answer, though, is no, it's not worth delating, uh, except in extreme scenarios where you're doing competitive overclocking, something like, like that. Because an extra couple degrees, 9, even 15, as Der Bauer saw in some of his tests, degrees off of the top, yeah, it can help with reducing noise. It can help with other things like overclocking. But it's a lot more work involved, and so it's harder to recommend that route. So gains require more attempts to get it right. There's more trial and error testing. If you start grinding down the die, lapping the IHS, it's more likely you'll see worthwhile improvements. And it's just, it's not like the 7980XE where you instantly see 20 degree drops across all cores with less than an hour of work involved. So we'd only recommend delating at this point for people who are pushing high clocks, who are competitively overclocking, or who are so neurotic about noise that a 100, 200 RPM reduction in fan speed will make your day. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's kind of where we see it being worth delating at this point. Anyway, those are the results with liquid metal. We know it's possible to do better. And we know you can lap the die or sand it down. We know you can grind down the IHS some more. But this, I think, is a pretty good representation of something that most people could accomplish in less than an afternoon, a couple hours of work. Anything more than that, you start questioning the, the time being worth it or not, more so than it is questioned here. So that's it for this one. As always, subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. Check out our, our initial review for the uh, fuller coverage of thermals. And Roman's video, of course, is still worth checking out if you want to see his more extreme approach where he grinded down the die as well. And go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up our new limited edition graph logo shirt. That's quad foil now. It's got four-way SLI foil going on. So check that out on the store. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.